Welcome, heroes and advocates, to another episode of Critical Conversations by Mind the Frontline, the vodcast that stands at the forefront of first responder health, wellness, and recovery. I'm your host, Chris Matana, a former firefighter and flight paramedic and president of Mind the Frontline, and I'm also thrilled to have you join us for today's exploration in some of the crucial facets of first responder well-being, especially as it comes to looking for those signs with those suffering amongst us. We have an incredible episode lined up for you today, featuring a special guest who brings unparalleled expertise to the discussion on the warning signs to look for in colleagues who may need assistance with Mackenzie Tex of the Raw Thoughts Podcast. The Critical Conversation Podcast is a dedicated space for police, fire, EMS, allied health workers, dispatchers, air medical, military personnel, and their families. Here we delve into the heart of the matter, tackling essential topics such as mental health strategies, recovery methods, treatment options, the latest research, and professional development opportunities. At My The Frontline, we are more than just a community. We are committed to fostering resilience within the entire first responder family. So whether you're on the front lines or supporting those who are, we invite you to subscribe, engage, and be a part of this vital mission. To learn more, please visit us at www.mindthefrontline.org. We do want to make a quick dis- show disclaimer before we dive into today's episode. We want to acknowledge the nature of our discussions on these podcasts. This podcast is dedicated to addressing those crucial topics. Some of those content discussed may be triggering or intense as we explore the challenges and the triumphs within the first responder community. We recognize that these discussions may evoke strong emotions or memories. If someone you know is struggling or needs immediate support, we urge you to reach out to your agency's mental health resources or local peer support group. If it is a time of crisis, you can contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline by phone or through text at 988. Please remember you are never alone and help is always available. Thank you so much. Enjoy the show. Hey, first responders, listeners, and Mind the Frontline members, welcome back to the Critical Conversations podcast by Mind the Frontline. Today, I am honored to have a guest speaker with us uh, who's going to be talking about our mission and fostering resilience within the first responder community. Along with that, we're going to be discussing kind of looking at some of the signs and symptoms in our fellow first responders and what we can come in to do to, to observe those, recognize those, and respond to those. Um, I'm absolutely pleasured and, and honored to have this guest speaker who brings the knowledge and, and the experience to our ongoing mission of fostering resilience within the first responder community. Our guest today is Mackenzie Teagues of Raw Thoughts Podcast, where she dives into the deep conversation with people to really just understand their life, their experiences. As a former paramedic, she's a real estate agent. Um, she loves to just connect with people and learn their sta- their story, you know, what's behind it. Um, along with being the, the host of the Raw Thoughts Podcast, you know, she's known for a compassionate approach to her belief in authenticity the dedication to building a community around her, including her local area. Through her platform, the Raw Thoughts podcast, she creates a safe space for individuals to share their stories, fostering understanding, their connection, their empathy, and really just through the power of storytelling, she gets these genuine connections that inspire healing and just meaningful connections that I feel like, you know, we are so lacking in today's kind of atmosphere. She has a focus on compassion, and she really likes to embrace the journey while being extremely raw and authentic. And she's willing to jump onto the podcast today. And we're going to be kind of talking about, like I mentioned, just some of those signs and symptoms we can recognize in our fellow first responders and how we can react to them. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce Mackenzie Teets with the Raw Thought Podcast. Hey, Chris, thank you so much for uh, having me on today. Absolutely. No, thank you so much for making the time. I feel like this is going to be a great conversation. It's been really good to connect with you. I've been following your podcast for a while and following you on social media. It's been really, really good. And and now just to kind of find that time where we could both kind of sit down and, and just have a raw discussion about some of these things, because I know both of us are very, very passionate in our communities and making these connections and, and, and how do we kind of approach some of these things. And I feel like the power of discussion and, and just having a good, thoughtful dialogue is one of those things that help us connect. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, the number one thing that I have, I think, lived my life by is being able to connect with people through their stories and really coming to meeting people right where they are and having curiosity, just having questions where, hey, I may not know what you're going through, but enlighten me, like tell me what you're going through, because it may not be me that I can connect with. It may be somebody else that I've heard their story and then I can connect you two together so that you have a, you know, um, a true connection on what that struggle is. And what we've seen and what I have seen, especially within this podcast is not only, you know, a community being built, but a community willing to help each other. And I think that is just one of the most amazing things to see and be a part of and really being, you know, that pioneer in the mental health space, especially within our first responders, having been a first responder, um, you know, having grown up with my parents being in in, uh, the public service realm as well. My dad was a paramedic. My mom was a 911 dispatcher. Um, many people that I call my aunt and uncles, they also are in the first responder realm. So it's just kind of what I know. So you're, you got a, you got a very long family lineage of just first responders and in different industries of first responders, right? So you mentioned dispatcher, yeah. firefighter, you know, um, what are those? So, I mean, with having that diverse family, you know, for me, I, I you know, have some veterans in my family, but I didn't have like, you know, a public safety family per se to learn from. Um, what were some of those things growing up that you now, when you look back as a now former paramedic yourself, that you really kind of started to identify uh, back in the day with maybe some of these things that we're talking about today, like the warning signs. Did you see some of those in some of your other family members that you're now able to kind of look back and kind of go, ah. Yeah, it's um, it's a very dynamic conversation, especially within the family of just, you know, healthy signs, unhealthy signs, um, you know, within all of us. And the careers take impact, um, but also life happens outside of the career that also can impact um, our mental health as well. So I think for me personally, um, it was a way that I could actually really connect with my dad and be able to call him and say, hey, like this, you know, incident happened or this is what my thought process was or these are the decisions that I made. And he was in the career for, um, you know, many, many years and a supervisor. And so I kind of had this like uh, kind of in with him. We didn't work for the same uh, counties. I actually that was one of my rules for myself was that as long as my dad is a paramedic at Canyon County Paramedics, I will not work there. And um, my mom had a uh, transition. She had worked for Spillman. So she was traveling across the U.S. teaching first responders about um how to use their CAD systems and in their in their new systems that they were using. And so, um, you know, I just made that promise to myself that I never wanted to feel like I was given a spot. I wanted to work hard for what I have. And I truthfully know that that is, you know, what I have done. So, you know, growing up, um, I think, first of all, talking about being a first responder's daughter, It was really easy to understand um, holidays and events that your parents aren't going to always be there. Um, It was something that, you know, it was more about the quality time with us of, um, you know, having Christmas on, you know, three days before or five days afterwards or whatever we needed to do to have everybody there together. I think that was really important for us. Um, And then, you know, also, there were so many times where it just was normal for me to go and see my mom at work. I would go hop in and, you know, listen in on the radios and see what was happening. And I could just sense there was differences. There was differences of when people call in on 911 and it's really not an emergency. I could hear the differences in people, what they would ask like, you know, literally calling 911, asking for a police officer to come over and discipline your child. It's like, no, that's not what police are here for. And so I just kind of saw the broader um, spectrum of what being a first responder was. And I was okay with, you know, having my life be 
on somebody else's terms. Um, I was okay with, you know, going to the station and knowing that I could get called at any time. Um, I did wildland firefighting before being a paramedic. That's actually what got me into being a paramedic. Um, there was just a, a crazy incident. We were driving down the road. We were actually headed to a fire and there was a helicopter that crashed on the side of the road. Um, and so it was like, you know, a month after getting my EMT, I was just like, all right, like here it is, you know, game um, on. it was game on. Yes. It was totally game on from there. And that's what actually made me want to be a paramedic. I was like, I want to know more. So I had no interest actually um, growing up to being a paramedic. I didn't ever ask my dad about it. And um, I was more on like the police and law side and wanting to be an investigator, de a detective. And so coming back to, you know, kind of the family, um, we always, you know, had family discussions at dinner time, and the it the blood the guts the gore like that never bothered us um we would have friends over for dinner and they would be like oh yeah you have to like be prepared to to talk around this family because they will just they will be raw like that is us you know yeah. and we we really don't have filters and um some of the times that can be bad sometimes that can be good and it was just kind of these open dialogues where we i feel like we talked about the the incidences, but we never really talked about how it impacted all of us. Um, there was one incident with, um, you know, my dad, I remember in high school, I was coming home from a softball game and, um, you know, getting a text of like, Hey, I'm safe. I'm good. Um, but like, this is what's happening. And, um, you know, that call specifically the patient had turned, um, you know, and ended up pulling a gun on them. They retreated out of the house. And so you just start thinking of these things that can occur. Um, both parents, I've, you know, they've always known I've been on this journey of mental health, psychology, and really getting to open up. Um, I, I will say I've seen a difference um, of somebody that, you know, I'm not going to say has, you know, taken better care, but um, has not coped in unhealthy ways. And I've seen one parent that copes in very unhealthy ways. And for me, I just, I knew that's not what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to be able to talk about how this bothered me. I wanted to talk about, you know, the things that we saw and the things that we do and the decisions that we have to make for people. Like, that's hard. That is very freaking hard. And not a lot of people talk about it. And I know myself very well that I'm a sensitive person. I do have a lot of compassion. I do have a lot of empathy. And that also comes with, you know, having a very big heart for people. And also the sadness comes too. And so, you know, one of my biggest things is the signs and symptoms. You have to call people on their bullshit. Um, you also have to be Agreed. there for, yeah, you also have to be there for when, uh, when it's their time that they need help, um, you know, calling people on their bullshit. One of my, uh, exercises that I, that I talk with and teach departments about is do the cards match. So you, if you were my partner, if you were my, you know, paramedic partner and you come on to shift and we work 48 hours together, right? That's a long time to understand somebody's habits, their behaviors, their patterns, you know, their moods. Um, and, you, you start learning about them, not only as a partner, but as just a human. And so one of the things is, you know, if you're coming to shift every single time, pretty happy, you know, you're ready for the day, we're doing rig checks, like things are good. Um, and then you just start coming to shift and you're not talking as much. You're a lot more down. Your mood is down. Like anything I say is, you know, you challenge me. I'm going to say something. You know, and, and I think as first responders, we get really afraid of that because we, we don't want to be rude and say like, what the fuck is going on with you? Like you are not acting yourself. We don't want to be rude by any means. Right. But we also want to check in, you know, these yeah. are, and I, I love what you put there because, you know, my crew, especially when I became a flight paramedic, you know, my fire crew, when I was a firefighter. They were very close to me. You know, we would 
get together after shift, get the families. We would do dinners. We would hang out, you know, very, very close knit family. Like you really get to understand who these guys are, their emotional, you know, ups and downs when they're off, when they're angry, you know, but I also look back in my own career. It's like, you know, just like you, like when I got started, I was like, yeah, game on, you know, first code save. I'm loving it. I love what I do. And, you know, now that I look back on my career, you know, of almost 20 years in EMS specifically, um, I could kind of see like, oh, okay. By, you know, about 2008, 2009, I was definitely starting to, start seeing my bag get heavier you know that's kind of what i say but it just kind of progresses and it just mm-hmm. kind of sucks the life out of you but everything you just mentioned like that was me I, I was the asshole i was the guy that would just you know come off and, and fly off of a handle i was very you know reactive um mm-hmm. i was very alcoholic <laughs> is another thing yeah. um but yeah you see these changes in these individuals and and i feel like a lot of people just don't know how to have that conversation right like they're like mm-hmm. dude you're you're off you're totally messed up you know but do i just let it go do i just right. go like hey how's things at home you know because we've yeah. all asked those little kind of dodgy questions but i like your kind of mentality of i'm gonna come straight at you like no frills no bullshit like dude you're a fucking asshole like what's going on mm-hmm. like wow you're different what can yeah. i do to help yeah and i think it's exactly what you said right we have to go straight to the incident we have to go straight through you know or to that person and say like yo like uh, you're not going to tell me that you're fine because what you normally right and in coming back to do the cards match you normally come into shift and these are kind of your your normal behaviors you're not acting like that now these cards don't match so what's occurring you're going to tell me because it's very very common you're going to tell me no everything's fine no, everything's fine. I'm okay. And I'm gonna say, I'm calling bullshit. I'm calling bullshit on you. What is occurring? What's happening? What, let's talk about it. Right. And I think once you, you know, kind of start um, not only calling other people out, because I got called out as well. I knew when, you know, maybe I was a little bit more snippy to my EMT partner, or I didn't explain things as well, or I just had higher expectations and I didn't communicate that to them. Um, I think one of the biggest things as well is we have to be able to tell people when we're not feeling okay. We have to be able to tell people, um, you know, hey, you know what, today, like I have a lot on my plate. My capacity is like lower than normal. Like I may need a little bit more of your help today. And I want to hit on that. I want to hit on that real quick because I feel like that's very important, Mackenzie, is, is people don't feel like it's okay to let other people know that, hey, I'm having an off day or my cup's full. You know, why do you think that might be? Why do you think we have such a hard time saying, hey, guys, I'm overwhelmed with life. I got things going on at home. I, I just can't take on anymore and, and communicate that in a safe, safe, you know, informative way. Why is that such a challenge? Why is that so difficult, do you think? I think it's, you know, what we have societally grown up with is that you just do it. You shut up. You don't complain. You don't talk about it. Right. And so all of these things that we've been told, even as kids, and then you start growing up and in, you know, school and more experiences that you get, it hasn't ever really been fully welcomed. And so it also is this, you know, I hate the word stigma, but it really is the stigma of, you know, I'm tough. I'm not going to tell people my emotions because then they're going to think I'm weak. And if I tell people that I'm not at, you know, a hundred percent, then they're going to think something's wrong with me or they're going to turn me in and I, and now I'm not going to be fit for duty or I'm going to tell somebody that, you know, I'm not at a hundred percent. And then now they're going to question every decision that I do make. And so it's these negative aspects that, you know, we want to avoid. And so when, when we talk about that, People aren't willing to just come and share that because they're avoiding the repercussions that they think are going to happen. So what I hear a little bit of and the way I see it is I I see fear, right? Mm -hmm. We're fearful, Um, could be intimidated or ego, right? Because I don't want to let everybody know that I just can't handle my stuff. Well, trust me, it's normal not to handle your shit. We just kind of made this industry where 
everybody apparently has it looking like, you know, on frontward appearance that we're handling our ship. But I can I can go back in my own career and look and recognize now my own partners that I couldn't at the time that they were really, really struggling. You know, yeah. and I do think that isn't a problem of uh, finding a way to, you know, just communicate, ha have a good con Maybe it's a daily check-in. Maybe you like creating a habit where like you and your partner are checking every day when you start your ship, like, Hey, how are you real? Do like, no shit, mm -hmm. real talk. How are you doing right now? Where's your mind at? You know, so yeah. I can help you navigate our ship today. I feel like we're just not having those conversations. No. And I think they get, you know, avoided because a lot of people don't know what to do when somebody does start opening up. Right. When somebody does start opening up, you're like, uh, now I know there's a problem. What do I do? Do I just what sit do with do this? Do I go tell somebody? Do I have to tell my supervisor? Like, where is this? Right. And touching on, you know, checking in with your partners. Um, I think it's very important that we check in with them, but more important than that as a partner, like I said, it is crucial that you say when you're not okay. Um, I had a, you know, a specific call with one of my partners. Um, we had two completely different experiences for this call. Um, it was a single vehicle rollover. One passenger was ejected, uh, died on scene. Um, and then the, the driver of it, um, you know, we really had to calm her down um, and get her to the ambulance, get her assessed. And, you know, when you look at that situation, when you look at the situation from the patient, they were headed to the hot, they were headed to the airport. They were driving. Something made her wreck. She now basically has killed her husband. He's dead. Right. And so, um, what ended up happening was, you know, we were trying to get her to the ambulance to get her assessed. And, um, one of our officers had actually touched her while she had an injury there. And so she, her reaction was, you know, come come back to to punch him and luckily she didn't but um we we got her into the ambulance we got her assessed we got her to the hospital and um you know through that situation for me I was still a pretty new paramedic and I was really proud of myself of like getting this communication to her of how we needed to get her help as well and understanding this difficult time um but at that time, she's also in that same vehicle. Like there is injuries yeah. that I don't know about. We need to assess you. So you also don't die. Right. And we had taken her to the hospital. Um, it's about a 45 minute drive from, you know, or it was from our, our trauma center to back to our, our County. Um, we were pretty rural. And so that gives you 45 minutes to be able to have a discussion with your partner. Um, it has, you know, time where, yeah, you could chart or you could, you know, play on your phone or you could not pay attention or you don't want to talk, but that also gives you time to be able to communicate to them if something is going on. My partner actually um, had told me at that time, he's like, you know what, that call really is messing me up. And I was like, really? Like that seemed, you know, in, in our world, I'm going to say it, it was pretty routine. Like we didn't have mm -hmm. to do any interventions on her. There was, you know, it, it was pretty simple. And then there you have me who's internally thinking like, gosh, McKinsey, like, I'm so proud of you of the way that you communicated on this. So here I'm having yeah. a good experience and my partner's having a bad experience. And we were at the same call. Well, what was occurring was that, you know, he had seen so many of these situations. There was family stuff going on. There was other things, other factors that were intruding on this. And, and just was not sitting well with him. And so for him, he said, you know what? Like, I know you're about mental health. Like, I, I'm going to have to get help, you know? So he not only informed me on that, um, we, you know, he was able to get some help. And I'm I'm very proud he's still in this career. And the, the amazing thing of that was I then got to be able to check in on him. I then got to be able to say, Hey, I know time is, is a little bit more rough right now. Like let's check in with you. That gives you an opportunity to talk with them. It also gives you an opportunity, especially as a paramedic where tones go off. We had two crews there. Maybe he didn't go on that call. Not that I don't think that he can't handle it, but let's not 
add more stress to him. Let's not add more situations. Like let's give him a little bit of a break because I mean, plain and simple, the shit that we do and the decisions that we make are hard. It is not an easy career. It is not an easy, you know, decision process. Like you are making decisions on behalf of other people's lives of, you know, is this a good decision or is this a bad, like you, this also can come back on you. You have lawyers coming back on you. You have the hospitals, you have the patients. Like there's so many external factors. Your medical of, director, you're charting yeah, everything. I mean, you everybody, know, you're just everybody. But I, I think it's called, I mean, there's a great term out there in another podcast that I follow called heavy lies a helmet, but that's why they came up with that, that name because it is, you know, the burden that we as first responders to make those quick reactions, quick decisions, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a police officer responding to a call, corrections officer going to break up a fight, first responder going out to an emergency, you know, assist, all of those are split second life decisions, you mm -hmm. know, and some of those decisions you struggle with as a first yes. responder. I know I, there, there would be calls that I would struggle with the decisions that I made for weeks and still, still to this day, some of those decisions are still with me. And they just, the longer you're in this career, I call it like a matchbook, right? Like every, every year you're just lighting a match. Eventually you, you run out of matches and you get burned out like it mm -hmm. and not communicating and not debriefing, checking in. That's great that your partner gave you that opportunity because now you have an open line to check in, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and say, Hey, you know, what's up, you know, how yeah. Real talk, how you doing? And I also like the fact that you, you know, were mindful about when they do come back. You know, I, I do feel like when we bring people back, for example, like this, this is what is what I feel like is so backwards with our industry right now. If I go out and I break my ankle or even sprain my ankle, right? I can't work. I got to go out on, on, you know, leave, things like that. I'm going to be seen by physicians. I'm going to be seen by an orthopedist. I'm going to go to rehab. I'm going to go to occupational therapy. And then they're going to slowly rotate me back onto the truck or whatever, you know, department agency I come from and, and return me to full duty. Now I get a brain strain, right? I have a critical incident. I now have to call this number and I get 10 of these kind of so-called you know, check-ins mm -hmm. with this person that I've never spoke to before. I have no idea who they are. I don't know what they're about. And in my, my experiences in utilizing some of the EAP programs that I utilize with the companies I was with at the time, you know, it was very inhuman, um, mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, they were just, and I know what they're doing on the other end. Like they're just checking mm -hmm. a box. They're just like yeah. asking you questions, checking a box. Like, um, but then after the end of my 10 visits, guess what? I'm back out, back full, you know, back to doing five calls, five, you know, traumatic, you know, uh, arrest, whatever it may be for you. But like, there's no time. And not only that, like, I didn't get to go see a therapist. I didn't go into rehab and kind of slowly bring my brain back into uh, context and be able to wrap things around and, and now digest what I've just seen and move on. Uh, yeah. Your partner, you said it was a very kind of routine call. You know, I want to bring up a call that I had. I remember, and it just, it still sticks with me because it was a routine call, but it was the routine call that finally added up. And that yeah. we never know when that's going to happen really at the end of the day, but we were, it was Thanksgiving morning. I remember that because I was supposed to be going home that day and I was looking forward to it. Uh, we got toned out, uh, in Oregon. I was flying out of a base in Tillamook, Oregon, got toned out to go down to Lincoln city. And this was for a dump truck versus car, icy roads. I know this is going to be probably a bad call. Um, pediatric entrapment with their dad, um, dad and the, uh, uh, the patient end up going to the hospital before we can get to the scene. So we go and rendezvous with them at the hospital and I'm just sitting there and I'm talking to this little girl who's scared out of her mind. They were going out to find these little sea glasses, you know, mm -hmm. on the beach, you know, in, in the Pacific West, they used to use glass to keep the nets afloat. And so they were, that was their Thanksgiving morning thing. They were going to go do that before they went home. And it just happened to be a bad day. But, you know, for the most part, I stayed with her. We got our transfer. Yeah. You know, it was a routine call. My partner, yeah. no, I, I, nobody was seriously, seriously injured. It could have been a lot worse. Don't get me wrong, but 
it was just the energy that I put into that and attached to with that little girl. It just, and that was the first time it twisted me in some way that I've never, ever felt. And I just struggled with the whole flight back, the rest of my ship. Why is this eating at me? Like this was, you know, but it triggered me based on other calls that I've had that were similar, similar type of patients, similar type of girl, similar type of hairstyle. Like I started having flashbacks and smells and, you know, it's very, very difficult. Yeah. And I think that is the part where, you know, it's our brain that is reacting to these. It's not, it's not like we consciously are deciding like, oh, hey, I want to be triggered right now. And this is what's going to happen. That's it. That's yeah, not the thanks. reality of it. Right. Like Can we schedule you. this for later. Like I got a lot going on right now. Yeah, exactly. You know, and then, you know, every call is completely different. And I think so many people talk about it being this critical incident and most of the time it's not it it really is not the things that stick with us are the patients that we go out to you know five times in a week and you're like can't you do something for yourself you know you're 700 pounds and you want me to pick your ass up off the ground again like how about you move yourself you know like those are the things and you can't say that you can't sit there and say that to that person right but it it Those are the issues that start, you know, I'm going to say, you know, impeding on us or the, the breather that, you know, doesn't want to take their medications, aren't compliant. And then now here we have them in CHF and, um, COPD and, and they're trying to gasp for air. And I'm like, do you even want to live? Why am I doing this? If you don't even want to live, you're not helping yourself. I remember those same conversations I would have in my head with some of my patients, like, do you even want to be here? Like, why are you bothering me? Yeah. You know, I've like, been out here five I- times. Like you, you clearly don't want help if you're not going to fix your problem. Yeah. And it's like, so here we are, you know, trying to do our best and, and not get salty with our community members, you know, trying not to get salty with people's decisions because they're out of our control. Um, but you know, they do impact us. They do, you know, even you talking about that call, pediatrics are one of those things that innately it is going to be difficult. Why? It is difficult because us as humans want to protect the young, even if they are not ours. I don't have children of myself. I have nieces and nephews, but I can tell you hands down, children are my soft spot. Like I love, I love, I love children. I love our teenagers. I think they're so fun. They're so innocent. Like they just have these imaginations, you know, and it's so cool to just see what they are learning in life. And that comes with, you know, us as adults wanting to protect them, us as adults saying like, no, they're too young. They shouldn't be gone yet. Right. No parent should lose their child. And the, and those decisions start coming into play as well. And those emotions, it all comes back to emotions. It all comes back to energy. You had spoke about that too. The energy that you expel out to these people, where are we getting this in return? Are we giving ourselves the good energy back? Are we getting this from somebody else? Are we just masking things with alcohol? Are we masking things with infidelity? Are we masking things with gambling? Like what is actually occurring, right? And so that yeah. is also why, you know, I say like calling people on their bullshit. Like I what I would much rather somebody come to me and say, hey, Mackenzie, like, you know, this situation, maybe you could have said that a little bit differently. And I'm like, you know what? Yes, you are correct. I'm, I apologize for that. I will work on that next time. I get that, right? Even within, you know, my family, I've asked them, I'm like, what patterns do you see of me that are not healthy? Like, please tell me because I want to be able to work on them. And it also just saying that the people have to be willing to want to change, to want to heal and want to get better. It's just like those patients, you know, that call us for the 20th time. And it's like, well, you need to do something yourself we can be that patient as well. Right. You know, and, and I love how you put that because, you know, it wasn't until I think about two years ago and I had never heard about impasse before, you know, I've always felt very connected with people, things like that until, you know, my good friend Ginger Locke was like, Hey, do you, do you, do you think it might be an impact? And she kind of like walked me through it. And I was like, yeah, yeah. maybe I am. Yeah. And I did, you know, I, I, I absolutely, I absorb so much from people mm-hmm. and, and 
you know, that's why I got into this career. I mm -hmm. want to genuinely from the bottom of my everything of my being help them through whatever it is that they're going through. I don't care if they lock their keys in their car, they right. stub their toe, you know, that's what I got into this. And by not refilling my own cup through self-care, bad habits, you know, alcoholism, you know, anger, all sorts of things, you know, uh, I wasn't able to refill my own cup, you know, mm -hmm. and while you're over here being this, this jovial guy that everybody doesn't like anymore because you're an asshole, um, you start getting more and more isolated, right? And you get more and more alone, which puts you more and more in your head, um, fear, anxiety, all these other things come to play. It wasn't until I actually started going through, you know, sobriety that I went to AA and started getting just tools I'd never had before. My parents didn't get them. I didn't learn them. I didn't know. I, I, oh, Oh, this is how you deal with this. Oh, yeah. okay. It was just funny. It blows my mind because we don't teach that in EMS. We don't teach that with first responders. Like, hey, here are some tools on how you should react versus how you probably shouldn't. You know, mm -hmm. we don't educate people, I think, well enough, you know, beforehand, before it becomes a problem to really kind of give them the tools to, to help them save themselves or continue that self-care or self-arrest themselves. You know, we just we're not there yet. I don't think, I think we're, we're trying to be. Um, but at the end of the day, I see a lot of those kind of continue to play in with, yeah, it's a struggle because now that I have these tools, I can go back and use them in my day life and things have gotten easier and easier and easier. But when I was in my fog, you know, especially leading up to my, my last suicide attempt in 2021, I didn't think I was an asshole. I didn't think I had a drinking problem. It wasn't me. I'm the victim. Why isn't anybody calling me? Why does anybody love me? You know, these are all things that I think play in someone's head when you're really feeling like you're in that pit of despair. There was no thought of, okay, if I do this, I'll be able to do this. And then I should be able to get myself out. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't have those tools built in. And I see a lot of first responders similar to myself that also, I look at them, I go, they probably just don't have the tools. That's right. it. They just probably don't know. And it's just yeah. like I, when I was teaching critical care medicine, you don't know what you don't know, you know, mm -hmm. until you learn it from somebody else. Yeah. So and, having dialogue and these conversations are important. And I think it's so important, you know, that life is a lesson and we have to be open to learning those lessons. And, you know, sometimes those lessons can be learned through other people's stories. And that's what I absolutely love about, you know, Raw Thoughts podcast is, is I'm giving people the storylines of what occurred. It's not just, hey, this are, these are the tools that I use or this is what it works. You know, it's like, no, this is where my life was. When I use these tools, this is now where my life is. Giving people that perspective of, you know, hey, I, I need to kind of wake up myself. I need to be doing things differently. I need to be taking care of my own self differently. And, you know, it's so true. Mel Robbins talks about it, right? Nobody's coming to save us. Like nobody's coming to save us. It is us. I, I tell people that all the time. If you think someone's going to come in and, and swoop and say, oh, you're the victim and I'm here to save you. Well, that, that shining knight or that princess, that fairy tale, that, that shit ain't happening. I'll tell you right, right now. Like I, I spent 10 year, ten days committed in an in mental health institution, a behavioral health hospital. Nobody came to save me. I can yeah. honestly tell you nobody was coming to save me. The only thing that got me through was resilience and mm -hmm. just hoping I could get out and see my kids and then figure out the next freaking steps from there because... Yeah, I felt very alone and abandoned in there. And so I think it's important that people do understand that, you know, it's a false sense of security because I had it. I had that false sense. Hey, if stuff ever gets so bad that I got to get committed or checked into a mental health behavioral hospital, I'm going to get saved. I'm going to be great. That was not the experience I had. And I would hope that other people are not holding on to that same kind of fairy tale that I did. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I want to touch on, you know, being an empath as well. And, you know, these energies yeah. and, you know, just speaking energies, people are like, oh, that is so woo woo. Like that is so like hippy dippity, you know, like <laughs> that's not what we do here. And I'm going to also call bullshit on that because that's exactly what we do when we get on scenes. Right. 
Like, what is the energy on the scene? You can feel that. You can you can feel tension within people. You can feel love within people. Like, that is energy that is getting moved between all of us. And, um, you know, when those scenes get heightened and then you de-escalate them, like, that, that's all energy, right? So I actually, two years ago... Um, you know, kind of took a, a step and went to an energy healer. And I was like, I don't know what this is going to be. I have no idea. And um, I'm so happy that I did it. I, I actually just got a reading done um, last week. And she was like, out of the two years that I've seen you, like, this is the healthiest I've ever seen you. And, oh, and I was like, cool, the work's working, right? Like the tools that I'm doing are working. And, you know, I say that because us in pass, which are a lot of first responders, we just care for people. We care for people so strongly. And mm -hmm. that also can mean that we hold on to their energies. And as exercise is wonderful, I just talked uh, with TJ Webb on my podcast about that, about, you know, physical movement is necessarily necessary to get emotions moved. But sometimes that's just not enough. And you need to have another tool. And I, I say this because, like I said, it can be very out there. But as a paramedic, I understand it. I understand how our bodies, you know, can attach to things and fester onto things and and develop all of these sicknesses that we're seeing across the nation. I mean, there, we have never had a, a U.S. more sick than we do now. And we've also had, you know, never as many pills as we've ever had right now. And it's like, okay, this isn't making sense to me. This does not make sense to me that we have more medications than we've ever had. And we have more sicknesses than we've ever had. Like those, those two do not add up, right? There's something off. There's something bigger that's occurring and you know with this energy healing is it's a way for me to those energies that I get stuck onto that I don't even realize to get them off of me um there was actually you know I sell real estate full-time and I was helping my old EMT partner um you know purchase a house him and his wife and there was one time I had gone into the energy healer and she's like you're just kind of sticking on or, or like this man is just kind of sticking on with your energy. And I was like, I already know exactly who it is. Um, he had actually gotten hit by a car on his motorcycle. He could not be an EMT anymore. Um, I got off of the ambulance our time. Like he, you know, he was somebody that he was in my corner with me every single week. Like he knew me inside and out. He was one of those people to be like, you're being a bitch right now. Like what is happening? And let's figure it out because I don't want to work with you like this. Right. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. And we had so much fun. Like we got shit done, but we also had fun doing it. And, you know, that was like a release of that energy out of my body to, excuse me, to be able to heal, to be able to not only just heal, but to live you know, a good quality life. Like we do not, you know, go through these traumas to forget about them. We go through these traumas to forgive them, to forgive ourselves, to forgive ourselves of, you know, those thoughts that we have of, did we make the right decision or not? Did we make the right call or not? Well, all of those things are, you know, truly those raw thoughts in your brain that you think of when you're going to bed or when you're just out for a stroll. Nobody else knows those. Absolutely nobody else knows those unless you speak up, unless you say something. You're like, hey, I just like, I just keep having these thoughts and I don't know where these are coming from. Somebody else could say, hey, you know what? I've been there. I've, I've been in that situation. These are the things that I did. Or these are the things that like, I, I still have them, you know? It's almost like getting to be investigators for ourselves. Oh, you could just share and some of the best advice that I've learned is just from good communication and a being vulnerable, which takes time. You know, it, it's yeah. a, being vulnerable is a challenge, especially for someone who's not new to doing it. You know, yeah. I felt that as soon as I was able to kind of take my ego out of it and really kind of bring more humility into it. Um, I was able to be more vulnerable and share my story, but in sharing my story, I got to get real feedback from other individuals who I wouldn't have shared with me otherwise. 
but they would tell me like, Hey, well, have you considered this or have you done that? Like, have you looked into this? You know, then I start getting feedback, which is great because maybe I don't have the tools to make the next step by being vulnerable though. And just having a, you know, a, a good conversation, mm -hmm. I was able to walk away with some more tools to try, you know, yeah. and not only that, I've now let those people around me know that like, I'm not okay. And I'm, you know, so it, you're really starting to kind of slowly chip away at the stigma and all the other stuff that goes and surrounds mental health. Cause it's, one of it is stigma. Yeah. But we are our own worst enemies sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, we don't ask for help. We don't communicate. We shut down. And I know why, like, trust me, I had been that person, you know, mm -hmm. leading right up to my suicide. I, I had completely shut down mm -hmm. and now it's it's one of those things that those around me when they see me become silent they're like okay either chris is working really hard or he's not okay and and my friends know it's okay to check in either way like hey man mm -hmm. you've been kind of quiet just want to make sure you're okay you know or hey you know what's new what mm -hmm. have you been up to lately because now i don't have to be like, hey are you okay yeah. i can kind of just check in and be like Hey, so what did you do last week? Or, you know, what, what do you got going on this week? You know, mm -hmm. and just by them kind of telling me what they have going on, you can kind of get a sense of, yeah, they're great. They might be overwhelmed. They might be stressed or they just may not be as okay as they want to lead you to believe. And right. then that's kind of, you know, and that, that, that is a struggle. I think a lot of people on the other side of the fence that, Okay, so now we're being coming more comfortable with calling bullshit, right? Like, hey, we're going to call you on your bullshit. But now do we do with that bullshit? Right. Um, and that becomes a challenge in itself. And I still Absolutely. think we're, we are learning on, you know, how, what is the right way to do that? And there's no right way, guys and gals. Like, there just isn't. Um, being empath, you know, being, bringing empathy to it and being sincere. You know, those are like the mm -hmm. two things you could do. And just listen. Mm -hmm. I can tell you. That the recent study that just came out that I watched last night, um, they showed that just by getting on the phone call, it was a it was a, a, a spotlight on the 988 after it being two years kind of in progress, right? And they found that the reduction in suicide rates for someone who actually called and just had a conversation mm -hmm. reduced it by almost 45%. I want to say it was like 42, but almost 45% reduction that the fact that they're going to go on and actually, you know, follow through with what they're thinking. Yeah. And so it is extremely important when we talk about a buddy check, if they're not reaching out to you, you better be reaching out to them and yeah. get, make it a habit now. Cause if you make it a habit now, you know, for me, you know, most mornings I will just send just a quick little text to just random people on my, on my contact mm -hmm. list. Hey, I just want to let you know, I appreciate you. Or, Hey, thank you very much for whatever you did for me a while ago. Or, Hey, I hope you have a great week. Be well, you know, kind of little things like that, that really kind of just, you never know what it does for that individual's day or where that individual's at, but you're also training yourself that it's okay to talk about it, but you're also letting them know it's okay to do the same thing to their friends and, and yeah. their contacts. Yeah. I teach, you know, what does it mean to be raw? It means to be real, authentic, and willing to share. And that willing to share part doesn't always have to be talking, but it can mean your journal. It could mean, you know, with your therapist, it could be mean with your peers, your, your coworkers, your family, your spouse, you know, whatever that looks like. And that vulnerability is what brings us support. That vulnerability is what brings us connections, brings us, you know, connections to hope. It gets us connections to, you know, love and feeling that. And, you know, like I said, I totally believe in reaching out to people. But more importantly, it is when you are feeling off that you reach out to other people because they will not miraculously just know that that's what you're going through. And, you know, I love that part too, where you talked about just messaging people and, tell them you love them. Tell them you appreciate what they do. Like we do not say that enough to people. Like, I say, I love you to everyone almost. And they're like, yeah. you know, it's weird because if it's the first time that they've had a conversation with me and I say it, you know, and it was a good conversation. I'm like, Hey, hey I'll talk to you later, man. I love you. You know, they're like, yeah. Okay. You know, but then the next time it's like, yeah, man, I love you too, bro. You know, it's just, it becomes a thing because we don't put enough love and kindness and energy back in. And this is one way we can do that. Just like you were talking mm -hmm. about, like, how are we refilling our cup? How, you know, who's giving us the positive energy? Well, sometimes you got to go out and seek it and it's okay. Yeah. But you got to, you got to initiate that first step.
Yeah, absolutely. And that love part too, you know, um, it's, it's so easy to be able to find these situations that we can, you know, show this love and we can receive this love. And, you know, I think so many people are afraid of it because they've been hurt in some way where they expected or thought that somebody loved them. And then they did actions and behaviors that showed them that they did not, or that it kind of went against it. And to the caveat of that is that you can love everybody. You can trust few, right? You can love mm -hmm. every single person that you come into contact with in some way or some manner. And maybe it's that you love yourself so much that you're not going to put yourself in the situation and be around them anymore. Right? Like those are boundaries. Those are things that yeah. you're like, Hey, I actually, I'm going to show love to myself in this situation. And I'm not going to put myself in that anymore. And you know, to that is like, why aren't we telling people? Why aren't we telling people why we appreciate and love them in our lives? And I think, you know, to receive messages like that, just completely out of the blue, for somebody to message me and say, hey, I, I was just thinking of you. These are my favorite things about you. Like, I appreciate you being around the family makes me want to continue to do that because it's like they're actually showing me that they value that. And, you know, so many times, and and I'll say this even in like ex, you know, uh, relationships you know men have men have told me they're like oh i i haven't you know told you what i really feel and i'm like why the fuck not like what are you <laughs> so I, afraid I, I, of like, i am not a mind reader i tell my yeah, wife this like, all the what time are like, you, I, so... I, you gotta tell me exactly what it is that you want i'm not going to assume anymore because i've done that that gets me in trouble right. i'm not going to not just do anything because that definitely gets me in trouble right so it's like Tell me how you want this done. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, people are like, oh, well, I, you know, I, I told you once, like I told you once that I love you, but it's like, it is a continuous thing. It is a continuous working pattern that you have to put into for it to come back. And honestly, I mean, when you, when you start building these relationships and these connections, it's giving you more ties to life and why you want to live giving you more ties to gratitude. It's giving you more ties to saying, Hey, you know what? I'm not alone in this. I know I haven't talked with this person in four months, but they still, you know, I still matter in their life. And for that, it's giving people that are having these suicidal ideations, having these bad thoughts, just a little glimpse of saying, Oh, somebody does appreciate me. Somebody does value me. I do matter to somebody. It's it, when I teach organizational culture, well, one of the things I say is, is you got to create purpose, right? Like that, that's a, if I don't have a purpose here, then why am I even, you know, sucking air anymore? And a lot of people, when they start getting down this, you know, the SIs, the suicidal ideations and uh, extreme depression and, and things like that, uh, they really don't see that in themselves. Mm -hmm. They really do feel alone. And, and the narrative in their head is extremely, extremely hard to escape sometimes. So what if you just were that one friend that broke through and said, Hey, I see you. I appreciate you. And this is what I like about you because this is what gives you purpose. Mm -hmm. And that in itself could save a life. Who knows? Absolutely. But if anything, it, it makes us feel more valuable. I, I, maybe I'm off on this one, but maybe I, I feel like some people feel like, Oh, well, they know that I love them. Right. Yes. Like it's, it's unsaid, right? No, mm -hmm. I, I tell my wife as many times as I can. And sometimes it annoys the shit out of her and I don't care because mm -hmm. I, I don't know when I'm going to check out next. Like I've yeah. been there where a lot of people, you know, I'm sure they would have loved the opportunity to say, I love you one more time to somebody or, Hey, I appreciate what you did for me or any of that. And yeah. you never know when you're just not going to have that moment anymore, but also just being raw and, and vulnerable and, and showing emotion it, it does start, like you mentioned, it starts thinking about, oh, well, if they do that, maybe it just, maybe that's what they needed to change your trajectory and, mm -hmm. and have a better day because now they can go, oh, so-and-so appreciates because I did this. And now they can start thinking about maybe other little pieces of gratitude that they can hold on to and kind of use that as a gratitude rope, right? I'm going to pull myself mm -hmm. out of this funk that I'm in. And the other thing that I see that we do have some problems uh, with is, is, being okay with just sitting in the shit. There's, there's days that I, it's not all roses. Not every day is going to be roses. Uh, you're going to have those very hard, challenging days. 
what I, at least for me, I, I didn't get the tools on how to deal with challenging days. So what did I do? I freak out. I get anxious. I'm fearful. I can't deal with this. So let's just go drink a bunch of alcohol and I'll just forget about it for now. Because mm-hmm. it's going to go away, right? And never come back again. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the, you know, the hard part is, you know, societally, alcohol is so acceptable. It is one it of is. those things that gets pushed. It's one of those things that, you know, other people, you're in a group and they're, you know, you say, oh, no, I'm not drinking right now. And they're like, oh, well, what the fuck is wrong with you? And it's like, well, actually nothing, you know, like, is it not okay? I'm trying to, to save to my not... life, you know, that's yeah. all. Like alcohol is like, killing me. Yeah. <laughs> like we're, we're so easy to judge of why somebody is not drinking instead of, you know, saying like, good for you. Like I probably should slow down or stop or, you know. It's just that, that was weird. Me, I, I, I've been on both sides of that fence. I've had friends tell me like, hey, Chris, you know, I'm just going to kind of buy. Oh, you pansy. Come on, let's go. Let's get, you know, get, I never once I was, I was, I like, oh, maybe I need to slow down or maybe I just wasn't there. I didn't have those tools, you know, yeah. but I've also been on the other side where I've told people like, hey, yeah, you know, I'm sober. You know, now it's a health trend. So nobody really kind of thinks twice of well, is he an alcoholic or is he going to AA or is he just trying to be healthy, you know? Mm-hmm. And so now we, I think we're the stigma around alcohol, you know, I'm, I actually enjoy that it's changing a lot because you know, you're seeing more access to non-alcoholic drinks and things like that, but it is extremely, extremely prevalent in first responders mm-hmm. across every profession. Yeah. And it's one of the most common substances we go to, to cope with. Because mm-hmm. it's so readily available and so readily accessible and accepted by our yes. peers. You know, I get off shift. Let's go have breakfast beers. Nobody bats an eye. Right. I don't care. Hey, Chris is slammed. You know, he's so, too, super intoxicated by three o'clock. You know, I, my wife would come home to, from work around four or five sometimes. I'd be obliterated, completely obliterated. Because that, what did you do today? Oh, I got up and worked and then I killed a 30 pack. You know, good for me. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm totally fine. I'm, I yeah. got my stuff. I'm good. Don't tell me that I drink too much. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, and the other part too, I mean, alcohol is a depressant. It is chemically a depressant. And, you know, to me, I just, I question that also, just like I question big pharma. I question other questions from society norms. You know, I'm like, why are we accepting these? Like we personally individually get to accept or deny those. And, you know, that's the part of that authenticity is, you know, the, what are your core values? What are your beliefs? What are your, you know, you as a person, when you are standing alone, what do you stand for? And, you know, it's so important to, to know those. And I think for you, especially for people, you know, yeah, it's this health trend, but ask me about it. Like if you're, if, if you're questioning why I'm not drinking, ask me about it. I'll tell you. Like that's that willing to share part, right? I'm sure Mm -hmm. if somebody was to ask you and say, hey, like, why aren't you drinking? You're going to tell them. And those stories at that moment is where it may click for somebody. It may not click right at that second. It may not be a month, but they're going to remember that. And they're going to say, oh yeah, hey, Chris actually stopped drinking because he was an alcoholic and these were his behaviors. You know, it gives them the opportunity to learn a lesson it you can't put it on them you can't force it you know it's just it has to be their it has to be their decision to want to change it very much does you know i had to come to that decision that i wanted to live you know i had to come to the decision that man i never never would have seen myself to where i ended up you know, and I'm not saying it was a bad thing because it really did change the trajectory of my life and I'm alive. You know, I'm very, very thankful to be here and have this conversation with you, Mackenzie. Yeah, absolutely. But it was very, very easily could have been the other way. And, yeah. and by not talking about my feelings and that's, that is the one F word we don't talk about. We talk about all the other fucking F words except for feelings in our professions. Mm-hmm. Why? It's okay to feel people. It's okay to be human. You could still be big machismo man in the fire truck or, you know, on the helicopter or behind the badge and your cruiser to patrol car or the physician in the ER. You could still have a little bit of that ego, but you really do need to really check yourself before you wreck mm-hmm. yourself. I guess this would be yeah. a good way to say it. Absolutely. And it's those feelings 
you know, that are, are normal. And so many people, they want to, you know, they want to erase the bad feelings. They want to erase the sadness, the fear, the anxiety. And so that's why they, you know, cope in unhealthy ways to take those away. But, you know, when you take those away, you're also taking away the happiness, the excitement, the joy. You're also taking away the positive aspects too. And so, you know, for people that are listening, just, just take an, an inventory of your feelings during the day. You know, we are not meant to just have this happy life, happy day. Like life is a struggle and that's what it's supposed to be. And it's how we ever overcome those struggles to, you know, persevere and, and build that resilience. Like that is the resilience, right? And so just taking inventory throughout the day of like, what am I feeling? Like when I leave this podcast, I'm going to reflect on it and say, wow, I feel really proud of myself. You know, I've seen myself growing in the way that I'm communicating, that I'm talking, my presence on podcast, you know, all of these things are feelings. They are the feelings of you. And, you know, they, they need time to be processed. And, you know, one of the biggest things is our society is just a hustle and bustle atmosphere. It is let's go, let's go, let's go. You know, there's no time for breaks. There's no time for this. Like just keep pushing through. And that's what we're told. And that's what people do. And the unfortunate part is that it's really in those pauses in the resting and the recovery that you are able to truly feel what is going on and to, um, you know, truly like, like go to it and, and help fix it and to assess it and look at it and say, how is this playing into my life? How are these feelings playing to my life? What feelings am I trying to push to the side that really I need to be accepting? Like, is it the sadness? Is it the depression? Is it the anxiety when you go out into public? Like, what is it? Identify it. If you can identify it, then we can start working towards fixing it and not necessarily just fixing it, but practicing to be a better, healthier person with better habits for that. And bringing that up, I mean, it just, it takes work, you know, for mm -hmm. those of you who are listening, you know, those moments, and, and that is a little bit of the problem, at least with first responders, you know, we are in a hustle bustle, you know, atmosphere, it's go, go, go over time, over time, over time, burnout, burnout, burnout. And so we don't create those opportunities for ourselves to check in with ourselves, to decompress, to really just understand, you know, I was having a conversation with Dr. Tanya Glenn last week and, you know, I talked about, you know, some of the shifts I would work were six days straight where it's just back to back calls. You're, you're either running calls, charting, sleeping, eating, or going to the restroom. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's what you're doing for six days. And then you get done with six days and you got like 25, 26 calls that maybe you're trying to unpack all at once. And you, it's just, it just, it's a mime. It's a mind screw for you guys. And so having little moments during your shift, you know, hey, before you actually go and take the next call, as soon as you get done restocking, it's like, I'm going to go take three minutes. I'm going to go sit over here on this bench and I'm just going to listen to the birds mm -hmm. or watch the snowfall, whatever that might be. And really kind of mm -hmm. just check in with yourself and get those tools. This has been such a great eye-opening discussion, Mackenzie. I really do appreciate it. Yeah. Any kind of you know thoughts out of you know the, the good conversation that we had that you want to? What's like the one thought you would like to leave our listeners with as we kind of wrap up the show today? You know, I think the biggest thing that I want to leave with our listeners today is the fact that it's your duty to speak up. It's your duty to speak up about your feelings. It's your duty to speak up on how you're feeling. Um, don't wait for that person to reach out to you. It may not be in enough time. Um, so the self duty to being able to be raw, to be real authentic and willing to share starts with us. And, um, you know, I really do think that that is the strategy to decreasing these suicide numbers. I'm with you. That's why I like to have these conversations. Everyone that is either listened or came to a talk, whether it be me or anybody else sharing something on mental health, being vulnerable, sharing their emotions is always very well received. You know, it's just, we're not doing enough of it. And once again, nobody's going to come save you. You right. have to decide just like that patient that we continually run on. That's our, our, our repeat offender. Hey, if you don't take your Lasix, there's not much I'm going to be able to do in the long run. Right. You know, if you're a diabetic, if you don't you know, take your shot and your insulin, like there's not going to be much I can do unless right. you want to do that. 
Yeah. So I would encourage and challenge each of you guys listening or viewing today's podcast and episode to, you know, be that instrument of change. Choose to be the difference. Choose to stand up and check in with others. You are not the victim. You're a part of a, you know, a growing problem. And we could either choose to be a part of that problem and, and fan it on its growth, or we can really work to kind of change it and change the trajectory of it and really kind of make a better space for yourself. That's a long term. You know, I, 23 years in public safety, it would be nice to say I got another 10 or 15 years left, but I don't know what the way my, my, my brain is right now, you know, and I got to be yeah. very, very mindful of that. So for those of you guys that are listening, you know, I, uh, I hope that you take what Mackenzie said to heart. You know, I think it's extremely important. Take ownership of yourself, recognize when you're having an off day and just do the one easy step. Just say, Hey, I'm having an off day. Mm -hmm. You know, start small. You don't have to go big. You don't have to give them a whole story or narrative. Just tell them one little thing. Hey, I'm off. You know, I, I need some help. You know, and that's all you need to do, you know, let the system, let the, let those around you, you, uh, that are holding you up, you know, take it from there. So, yeah. All right. Absolutely. Anything I, else? Yeah. I, um, one more thing, you know, I just want to be able to offer to the listeners and your listeners that if you're needing help to understanding how to be vulnerable, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, I do have a first responders group call as well. So if you're wanting to actually learn how to be doing these things, um, if you don't want to reach out to a therapist, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a counselor, but I would love to be able to coach you guys um, on an individual level and be able to really implement the change because if nothing changes, then nothing changes. And there's a lot that needs to be changed. So um, just want to offer that to your listeners to reach out to me. Um, if they would like to be on the podcast, they're more than welcome also. And uh, yeah, head over to all of my episodes on Spotify, Apple, uh, YouTube, uh, talk with not only first responders, but other community members on mental health. And where can they find your coaching? Would that be at uh, the raw thoughts podcast.com? Yeah, so you can either go there or um, probably the easiest access to me is on Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, just shoot me a message. We'll get everything lined up for you. And um, we do have a couple things coming up in um, December and February. So that's going to be some first responder events, um, some webinars. So definitely stay tuned to those and uh, can be another access point to getting coaching. Well, I love it. Thank you so much for sharing yeah. those resources with our listeners and our viewers. And, you know, like you heard from Mackenzie, go check her out. Check out her podcast because, you know, these raw conversations, you'd be amazed at what you get out of them. So as we wrap Absolutely. up another enlightening episode of the Critical Conversations by Mind the Frontline, we just want to extend a heartfelt gratitude to Mackenzie. Thank you so much, Mackenzie, for sharing your just valuable insights on working through, you know, recognizing the signs and symptoms of, you know, when someone's just having an off day, you know, yeah. I think that's ex starting with the fundamentals are extremely valuable. So yeah. uh, the depth of the knowledge, you know, and, and the conversation that we had today was extremely just uh, enlightening, at least for me. Um, and I do hope it, you know, further enhances the mission of promoting first responder mental health, wellness and recovery, which we are both so passionate of. Yes. So for our viewers and our listeners, if you found today's discussion enlightening, enlightening and you want to stay connected with our ongoing mission, don't forget to hit subscribe right now. Hit like. Um, you can also find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and obviously the Mind the Frontline website at www.mindthefrontline.org, where we have state-by-state, -state, national resources, blogs, podcasts, and more and more resources coming. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. Your subscription ensures that you never miss an episode. It's a powerful way to show that your commitment to fostering the resilience within the entire first responder community and helping me and McKinsey out with our missions and getting the word out. To our dedicated listeners, thank you for joining us on this critical journey. Your support makes the impact of these conversations resonate even further. Let us know your thoughts by leaving a review or a comment in the, the, in the uh, show notes below. Uh, for more information, for additional resources, you can just visit our website, www.mindthefrontline.org. Together, let's continue these critical conversations and build a stronger, more resilient first responder family. Thank you again for being a part of a Critical Conversations podcast. Until next time. Take care, stay strong, and mind the front line. Cool. Thank you, Chris, so much. Mm -hmm.